So good evening, Brent, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, our Zoom meeting, our 10th Zoom meeting. As the guidelines from the Grand Lodge of Scotland asked me to remind you that I need to see your faces and your names to <coughs> sure that we don't have any cowns or eavesdroppers with us. This week, Brent, I'm delighted to welcome to us our worshipful brother, Martin Fox, uh, from the Bur Burlington Lodge uh, down south. He is probably better known as the managing director of Lewis Masonic Publishing, who are one of the, the leading publishers of Masonic books and have been for many, many years. And I believe they're the oldest Masonic publisher. Uh, for the, the railway enthusiasts, uh, Ian Allen Publishing uh, used to publish lots of books as well about the steam trains and things like that. Uh, Martin joined uh, the craft uh, a few years ago and he went to the chair in his mother lodge in 2009 and in 2018 he published the book The Art of Memory and as I said last week when I was given the introduction to him I think this is a, a book that my proposer and seconder would have wished that I'd read nearly 30 years ago when I joined the craft and I was beginning to take on the job. So I know for one that they're very much looking forward to uh, me learning something this evening as I go back to the chair of my mother lodge next year, hopefully COVID-19 uh, excluding. So, Bern, I'm delighted to hand over to Brother Martin Fox. Thank you very much. Uh, Worshipful Master, Brethren, thank you for and having me here. It's wonderful to be talking for, uh, to a Scottish lodge here uh, about the art of memory. There's, there's a kind of theme in Freemasonry. Whenever you research something, you find it has Scottish origins and it, it all, all roads seem to lead there. Uh, we, you talked about me working for Lewis Masonic Lewis Masonic was actually uh, the son of a famous Scottish poet, uh, James Hogg. His son was a printer. And he came to London and started a Masonic publishing company in um, 1886. Um, there are um, some publications that seem a bit earlier there than that, so it's quite hard to put an exact date on it. Yes, my mother lodge is Burlington Lodge number 96, but the Freemasonry of my family comes on my mother's side. My grandfather was a member of Top of the North Lodge in Rhiney. And indeed, uh, you can't tell it by my accent, but a lot of my childhood was spent in Peterhead up near Aberdeen. So today we're going to talk about Freemasonry and the art of memory. And let's start off by just thinking about how important memory is to Freemasons. We really like memory. We're impressed when people can perform the ritual from memory, if they can remember the names of people visiting. Um, if we set up a lodge, we need to remember where everything goes. We like to erect uh, certain memorials for famous masons or we like to put up a plaque for uh, some event. We really like to make sure we remember things for a long time. But memory as part of Freemasonry really started right at the beginning before the appearance of uh, speculative masons as we we'd know them now. So most people in this group will be aware of William Shaw. William Shaw was uh, the, uh, the writer of the Shaw Statutes. He'd been appointed the Master of Works by James VI of Scotland. Now this is a, a picture that's meant to be William Shaw, but the creator of the Grand Lord of Scotland, Robert Cooper, he tells me he's not sure whether it is. Maybe we don't know what Shaw looked like. But Shaw was hired, or rather given the job, uh, by the king of getting the uh, Scottish uh, 
stonemasons into some form of organization. There were already lodges functioning, uh, but they weren't working together. And I suspect that Shaw was given this job because the, the stonemasons were Catholic and so was he, and they thought that maybe that connection would be a connection between them. We also know that Shaw had learned some stonemasonry in, in his youth for his own self-development. What an amazing thing to hear that is, a gentleman like him. Shaw was a real polymath. He studied a lot. And James the Sixth, he was a great supporter of learning. Uh, you don't hear much about that. But there was, he had his own alchemical, log, um, alchemical laboratory. He, he used to sponsor and support people who had a, a great interest. He liked to know about things. He would had a, a very good education when he grew up and he continued that as time went on. Now we think that's actually Shaw's uh, Mason's Mark there. So on the, the uh, the side here, it's looking, it's on the right for me, it might be on the left for you, we see the Shaw statutes. And these Shaw statutes uh, were issued, uh, first of all, in, um, uh, we may have to date, date there, but uh, I think it's uh, 1598 and 1599. Um, yes, that's correct. And the 1598 one obviously caused a bit of a stir it doesn't mention Mother Kell winning. It gives all the control to Edinburgh. So it obviously had to be a bit rewritten with a compromise. So the next year we get another Shaw statutes. So this is the first Masonic Book of Constitutions. That's really what it is. And if you read it, if you really read it, it's in a... Uh, sort of the dialect of the time and of the place. So it takes a lot to sort of uh, to get to grips with it. But if you really go in, in, into it, there's two sections. There's a bit which is about being a stonemason, looking after your tools, being a member of this lodge and making sure you do your work well. And then there's the second section, which is about membership. And that section is gold because we start to see that the Lodge had a system that we might recognize now. Uh, new members have a proposer and a seconder who are of good memory, and they are put in a, an entering book ready to be made a fellow of the Lodge. We know that they had to memorize some questions and answers. That's a bit unusual, the idea of learning that before you become a Mason, uh, but that's, that's what was happening there. And there's a suggestion of two degrees, there is a sort of a hint at that, that possible bit. But here's where it gets interesting. He doesn't call it Masonic ritual. He calls it the art of memory. He actually says that the wardens of the lodge and the brethren will have to practice this art of memory, as will the fellow crafts and the apprentice. So we can kind of see the degrees forming. And if they get anything wrong, they'll pay a fee for their slowfulness. So there we are, have it, Brethren. I'm glad that hasn't continued. You don't, you can imagine if you got fined every time you made a mistake in, in the ritual. Uh, maybe that would lead to greater, better ritual. We also see that the new members pay for gloves for all the members there. And that's a very useful thing if you're a stonemason to have lots of gloves. And you can see they run, these are regulations for running a lodge. But that phrase, art of memory, it's really important for us to think about that because it means a lot more uh, than it would to us now. The art of memory was a very specific term for a practice when you would imagine a building in your mind's eye. And you would practice walking around that building again and again and again, always stopping at the same points. I did an analysis of all the books published in English, and there's 
256 of them at the time, and every single one of them that uses the term art of memory means this use of a memory palace, an imaginary building as a filing system. Now this may seem like a bit of a strange idea, so please allow me to explain how this would work. Let's imagine that you wanted to remember a list of things. You could use your house as a filing system. Let's imagine it's the shopping list. You walk up to your front door, the first item on the shopping list would be milk. Very easy to remember, milk, it always gets dropped off at the door, but you need to put that milk in there in a funny, silly way. So imagine uh, it in a way that would allow you to always bring it back. So it needs to be shocking, it needs to be a joke, it needs to be rude, or it needs to be emotional, horrifying, whatever you can do. Maybe you could imagine that you come up to your door and the door knocker is a pint of milk and it smashes. Very easy to remember. You open the door, you walk through, uh, maybe the second thing on your list is bacon, you come to where you normally hang your coats up and there's bacon all along the coat hangers. Silly, easy to remember. Keep going through your house into your living room. There on the settee, on the couch, you can have, there's a chicken sitting there, your third thing. That list is very easy to remember. When you got to the shops, you just say, right, okay, I'm, what am I here for? Right, uh, first thing, door smashing milk. Second thing, it's, it's a very visual, easy way to remember things. This was the common way of remembering something if we were to go into uh, 16th century scholar. Uh, it was, that, that's what the art of memory was. So why are they calling Masonic ritual the art of memory? Well, that's quite interesting. If we think about it, it might have been strategic. Maybe if you are writing a book of constitutions for stonemasons uh, in uh, 1599, uh, you don't want to do something uh, like put secret ceremonies or initiations. Maybe you want something that you know what it means, but others don't. But also, it is a bit interesting to see the connection between this memory art and what we'd see as Masonic ritual. So our ritual does take place in a memory palace. We have King Solomon's temple. And at the time they had no lodge building, so it was in your imagination. And in our ceremonies, we do walk around in a set route. If you don't believe me, just try changing it next time you're the deacon. <laughs> they, they, we've got a set route that we do stick to. So maybe if we were to be present at a stonemason's lodge in that time in Scotland, they would see ritual as a form of memory practice and they'd see this as part of this art of memory. Now, for many years, people have been wondering about this. You see, the art of memory in Scotland at that time had different forms. There was the classical art of memory for making speeches that came from ancient Greece. There was the Christian art of memory where there was a belief that if you made the right memories, you'd be able to act piously and virtuously and be a good Christian. And then there was the mystical hermetic art of memory, a method of remembering things in a certain way that was said to be able to upgrade your consciousness, to lead to a higher state of consciousness. And there were masters of all three of these arts in that royal court where this was written. So let me explain a little bit about these different memory arts so we can look at the suspects and think which one of these had an influence on our Masonic ritual. The classical art of memory. 
The first record of it is from uh, 450 years uh, BC, but this is only a fragment and it's, it's not quite formed. Uh, later on, um, uh, we see it start to come into more of a um, structured sense. It is said, however, that it was a lyric poet called Simandes of Chios, who he invented this after a shocking event in his life. It was said that Simandes, who was a, a really famous poet, a bit like a rock star of the day, he had been hired to perform a speech for a man called Scopas, a, a tyrant of a particular uh, island. At the speech, there's a big banquet, he performs his poem and he starts as he normally would do by dedicating the poem both to the twin stars, uh, Castor and Pollux, Gemini, uh, but also to Scopas, his host. And he performs the most amazing speech. And it's so shocking that there's complete silence, just like there is here now. <laughs> and everyone's very happy, apart from Scopas. He turns to him as he sits back down to the festive board and says, as you have only dedicated half this speech to me, you will only be paying half your fee. If you wish to get to the other half, maybe you can ask those twin stars in heaven for, the, for that. So Mandy's didn't have enough time to be upset. There was a knock at the door and a messenger told him that two young boys had come to see him. Maybe the stars themselves had come down to pay that fee. When he walks out of the room, it's lucky because the whole of the building just suddenly collapses behind him and kills everyone. There's no one there to see him, but it seems he's been saved. Then afterwards, when all the family come round and there's all these people who have passed away, they're trying to identify the bodies. No one can do so. They're so badly damaged from this collapse. But Simandes discovers that he can remember where everyone was. He can remember it from who was sitting next to them and what they were eating. So he realizes that location and having something else in that location helps you remember things. And he invents this art of memory. Now this story is very suspicious. It's too memorable. Uh, Gemini are good representation of memory because it's twins, which are meant to be a copy of each other. So it's probably just a way of us remembering the principles of memory. But this art of memory became a part of speech making and it was practiced throughout the ancient world from ancient Greece all the way through to the end of Rome. It was so connected with making speeches that the word topic, which means location in Greek, has come to mean something you talk about. But what they were doing is they'd imagine a building, normally one with lots of pillars, and they would imagine a different set of locations that they'd stop at, they'd imagine walking around that building, and they'd put prompts for their speech in there. And these prompts could be small, or they could be complicated. So let's imagine you wanted to remember the story of someone's life. You would imagine that person standing there, and you would imagine things on them that would remind you. Uh, so if they were born in uh, Edinburgh, you'd imagine them standing on the castle. If they were hanged, you'd imagine them holding a noose. If they wrote a book, you'd imagine them holding that. If they were warrior, you'd imagine them holding a sword. This would be in your imagination. So when you caught that bit in your talk, you'd be able to say, so here I am. So-and-so from Edinburgh who was hanged, he was a warrior and wrote a book, you'd have all that ready. And you'd have whole palaces in your mind, whole buildings to remember. You should go home. Now we know how they did this, not from um, the fragments I mentioned in Greece, but from, um, there are fragments of writings from um, the Roman times. The best one is called Rhetorica ad Herenium. That's um, speech making for Henry.
We don't know who Henry was, but I'm glad they wrote the book because it's given us the record. In the medieval time, they thought this was by Cicero. It wasn't. But there was also Aristotle. He wrote a bit about memory, not so much about this art. And then we, um, we have the writings of Cicero, which refer to it. So we do know what they were doing. So this was just a utilitarian memory system for people who needed to be able to remember things professionally. People who practiced this art could do amazing things. There are centurions that could remember the name and the uh, city or place of birth of every one of their men. There are poets that could recite the Iliad backwards and forwards, word for word. There are solicitors that could remember every legal case they ever had. And it was this kind of thing that, um, that was used for. Books were also written like this. So it was deliberately made so that if you changed uh, a subject, you would change your location in your writing. So we see this in Plato, we see this in other philosophical works. But Rome was to fall. And as it fell, a lot of what was in there started to be lost. In the chaos that resulted, the art of memory somehow survived, probably because it was designed to be memorable. But when it came back like a phoenix from the ashes, it was no longer a means to speak, persuade, or to perform your job. It was wearing a crucifix and teaching a means to change who you are and to live a better life. Saint Augustine wrote, who was of course present at the fall of Rome, Oh God, when I go to the spacious fields of my memory, I cannot find you there, for you are the only thing that I know that I can't remember. The Christian art of memory followed the same principles as the classical, but it took on a different feel. The whole thing is based on the idea that everything you put in your mind becomes you. That you could improve your character or become more virtuous by remembering things. Now, not many people believe this now, but we still do. We memorize very long rituals and uh, we contemplate symbols till they become part of us as a means to change and improve, to make a good man better. So the Christian art of memory has that same goal. The idea is that you will be able to walk the path of life and you will not fall off the straight and narrow if what's in your mind is correct and if your mind comes to the right images. This was really uh, written about in depth by um, the um, uh, St. Albert the Great and his student, St. Thomas Aquinas. And they did commentaries on Aristotle and they did writings on how this would function. But in Scotland, they had a favorite way of doing this. They were very interested in a writer called Hugh of St. Victor, uh, from, uh, who, who had produced manuals of memory. And these are manuals for if you're a, um, a religious literate person, if you're a devoted either a monk or a, a nun, you would have some of these beautiful texts and they would teach you a memory palace which was based on a religious a symbol. And if you read these texts, which in at Dryber Abbey and uh, at um, Kelwinning, they were copying these out and distributing them. And they even, at Dryber, there was actually a, um, their own writings, which are like variations. They did one based on the tabernacle. 
it taught you a method of remembering biblical lessons which they liken to being a master builder. In Corinthians, it says that we should make ourselves master builders. It's the idea is that we should be reforming ourselves to be good Christians. That's what it says. And they took it seriously. And they used some interesting analogies that you may find um, familiar. They used to talk about turning yourself from a rough stone to a smooth stone. And this was done by remembering the right lessons. They used to talk about a device they called a machina in Latin, which was lifting. So it's how builders lift things. They used to say, good lessons in your mind lift you up. They, we call this now in memory, memory experts call it the master builder trope. So let's be clear. This was seen as a craft. The medieval writing that's called the craft of memory. Um, like a builder would learn to make their tools first, or a stonemason rather, learn to make their tools first. In memory, you learn how to make memory palaces, you learn how to make memory images. It was a craft that you practice. But what kind of memory palaces did they use? Oh, it's wonderful to see anything that you can think of, which is biblical, became a memory palace. This, the first picture you can see with the angels and the wings, this is actually a diagram of a memory palace of, the, of Noah's Ark. And this is actually something you should imagine in your mind's eye. You should walk around it again and again. And if you're not good at painting in your mind, if your imagination is very good, you can get some chalk and you can draw it on the ground. You can draw the shapes first, like as a master builder would. That's the exact phrasing. And let's be clear, the first masons that we've got the rituals of, they were drawing on the ground with chalk as well. So they thought they were doing the same thing. They used to call them mop and bucket masons because they used to do that. So in this, you're going to be reciting bits of poetry. You're going to be remembering symbols. You're going to be putting them in the imagination. The next one, you see this black and white diagram. This is called the book of the seraphim, you imagine the angel and you imagine each one of its feathers and each one of its feathers has a lesson and a poem and an image which leads you to salvation. Here's the breastplate of Aaron. Uh, there's a lovely uh, memory text on this. This allows you to remember lots of things. You've got 12 different uh, stones, you've got 12 months, you've got 12 tribes of Israel, you can remember sermons, you can remember different chapters, you can remember zodiacal things. Uh, the, um, this is uh, the coat of many colours. It's a common memory thing to remember things on your body. They used to use the coat of many colours and work through a, a rainbow on their body for, to remember different lessons from the Bible. And here's the big one. Brace yourself for this. If you've ever read Dante's Inferno, you know this memory palace. As time went on, some Christian practitioners started to practice using the levels of hell, purgatory, and heaven as their memory palace. They would walk through the level of hell, look to the devil there, look to those being punished, and remember what they weren't to do. And they would keep walking up through these seven levels of, um, the, of hell, seven levels of purgatory, remembering what they should do to make up for things, and seven levels of heaven to uh, lead to an understanding of the rewards of virtue. Some people doing this got more than they expected. So we have some records of a Cistercian nun, is one of the first ones, who was practicing one day, and she was on like something like the third level of heaven, and Boom! For a second, it wasn't in her imagination. She could see rays of light around her, and she could hear Santa, Santa, Santa. She could hear the praying taking place. She blipped into heaven. So this became a very mystical practice, and of course, this is justified in the Bible. We see in the New Testament uh, the description of someone visiting heaven while they're still in the body. We see in the Old Testament many people go directly to heaven, Enoch, and so on. Uh, this is something 
that wasn't seen as uh, impossible. So you can see that this is the, the extreme, but you can see the kind of religious angle that uh, the Christian art of memory took. But the favorite memory palaces were Solomon's Temple and the Tabernacle, this kind of thing, because they're actually buildings. And we can quite see why uh, the Scottish stonemasons may well have chosen Solomon's Temple. It's the first stone building in the Bible. Uh, people do mention uh, the Tower of Babel, but it was made of brick, and a good Scottish stonemason wouldn't be associated with anything as shoddy material like that. They, they looked for the first stone building in, um, in Solomon's Temple, that's the one. And there were many texts teaching you to imagine Solomon's Temple. So how does it work? Well, we see um, St. Thomas Aquinas quoting his teacher, Albert the Great, makes clear. Just as if you get bitten by a wolf, you're scared of it for the rest of your life, something that's a strong memory changes who you are straight away. There's no learning. So the art of memory can teach you the things you need to remember to do, whether it's good or bad, as a shortcut. If you remember a, a, a poem or you remember a lesson, um, maybe some of you can remember certain moments in your initiation or your, one of your other degrees which has stayed with you forever that, that taught you in a lesson uh, in, a, in a moment. Their favorite things to remember were what they called corporeal similitudes. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas states, lessons of virtue and vows of goodness slip easily from the mind if not held by a corporeal similitude. You want a symbol for it. You want something like that. He's, here are the seven liberal arts. They're very common. And uh, here are the seven virtues. All the descriptions that were in the classical art and memory were used by the Christians, but it's amazing to see how they get reinterpreted. So in Ad Perennium, it says, make sure you go uh, to a building which is real to practice. And make sure you go to somewhere which is quite out of town, so there's not many people. Make sure it's not too light, not too dark, so you can walk around it and make your memory palace in peace and quiet. By the time it's got to uh, the uh, Christian art of memory, it's, it's say, it, that's interpreted religiously. Go away into solitude, put yourself in darkness with only a little light, practice in pure silence. Um, when the instructions that said you should make images exciting, you remember the bottle of milk on the door, you should make something silly or rude or whatever, turn into, cleave strongly to lessons uh, and your heart, create strong holy images that will stay with you. So we need to now be clear that at the time that the sure statutes were written and for many years afterwards, everyone, and I mean everyone from the most thoughtful person at the top to just the person walking down the street, they all believed what you remembered would change you. So if you did something wrong at church, you may well be given a poem to learn to teach you to be polite. If you cheated on your wife, you may well be given some uh, religious text to memorize about being loyal. They even had lovely books called emblem books, um, and it's interesting to see how these developed a little bit later when you start to see uh, printing, which were for meditatio, for contemplation. And stained glass windows and symbols in churches, they're all designed to be memorized easily. Uh, when you see a statue at a church and they're holding different objects, they're doing exactly what I described before in memory uh, images, they're making a biography for you to remember. It's a great way to teach illiterate people. And this concept that it would become part of you if you remembered it is a strong one and one that would stayed with us for a very long time. 
so we can be absolutely clear about um, at the time when speculative masonry started to appear in lodges, there was a belief that just learning something would have an effect. The Christian art memory uses catechisms and uses emblems. Uh, they used to picture themselves a cloister in their mind's eye would be a very common one, or a biblical building like Solomon's temple, something that had a lesson in and of itself. We can see these uh, sources clearly written, and we're very lucky to have many copies of these. Uh, and the uh, Hugh of St. Victor being the main, most uh, influential in Scotland um, at the time. Okay, so if you've stayed with me this far, it's time to brace yourself for a bit of a journey. We've gone from memory in ancient Greece and Rome. We donned our togas and contemplated how this would be great for speech making or, or for storing things in a world where you didn't have a hard drive. Then we went to, into the early years of the Christian church and then looked at how this developed throughout Christianity as a means, not just to remember information for giving sermons and so on, but more importantly, to lead to being a good Christian as a means to change yourself, as a means of moral reform. Now we have to go somewhere very brave to the hermetic art of memory. When Marcelino Fuccino uh, translates uh, the uh, Corpus Hermeticum. He believes that he's found a, a teacher who is earlier than the, uh, the Moses. He believes he's retrieving ancient wisdom from Egypt. And this translation of a text becomes uh, the the book that's not being read by everyone in the whole of Europe. So the Corpus Hermeticum claims to be an enlightenment work which shows you how in ancient Egyptian tradition you can achieve a god-like level of power and consciousness. It's teaching you that everything that we see, everything around us, is made of the same substance as your mind. Your consciousness is just a, a lighter version of it. Everything is made of mind. Now you can see the picture of this beautiful winged figure here. This is a painting which represents uh, the vision of Hermes. This is him achieving a oneness with the divine mind. Through this, he is able to have superhuman levels of awareness and he's able to have supernatural powers. Well, what uh, does all this have to do with our mystery? Well, Giordano Bruno, uh, the a uh, famous Italian heretic who had developed his own system of hermetic memory to lead to this transformation from a human to a divine being. He had traveled uh, to England and he even visited Queen Elizabeth. But during that time, he took an apprentice. You only know of one direct student he ever taught his mystical arts to. Alexander Dixon of Errol. Dixon was a member of the Royal Court of Scotland, and he was such an expert at memory that for a while in Scotland, memory arts were called Dixon's art. His students were so skilled with cards, they were banned from all the gambling houses in London. They used to just go down to London, get all the money, and come back to Scotland. 
because they can memorize a pack of cards just by seeing it go cut. He was said to be able to remember things from other people's pasts and from the future. And he even, in, there's, a, there's a couple of poems around the time that claim that he remembered where William Wallace's ship was. And they went and got it. Where it is now, I don't know. It's, there's a, I know there's a team that are looking at these references to claim. So if he's in the royal court, could this have had an influence on Freemasonry? The hermetic texts that Ficino had translated led to a reinterpretation of the, the memory art. Messengers must be good at memory, and Hermes Trismegistus was a messenger. Trismegistus means thrice great, and many, many people saw that as a Christian um, reference. This was a, an ancient Egyptian who was predicting the coming of Christ. Remember how the Christian art of memory had statues? This book taught methods of how you could attract divine powers or thoughts into statues like they do in Egypt. What if you were to put those statues in you? This seems like a very surprising idea, uh, but it became a common practice in hermetic art and memory. We know of one character who started uh, this tradition and became very famous for it, um, Giulio Camillo. Uh, we've got his memory palace here. You can see this is an old uh, amphitheater. It's got the seven planets there. And he could then go into each one of these locations and become at one with a planet. And this would gift him with some form of supernatural power. We only have one example of him using this. He was in Paris and there was a display of rare animals and a lion got free and started chasing people and attacking them. And when it came to judo, he went into his memory palace, went into the uh, place of the sun and gained the powers which would be like Apollo and could calm the lion and it didn't hurt him. This is an amazing tale, but I actually believe it to be true because I found in one of his friend's diaries, which is just written, his friend wrote it for himself, an account of it. And you can always trust your friends to tell the truth and you know when they're telling the truth when they're being a bit insulting. Because he says, yes, it's true what Giulio did in the uh, park with the lion, but no one knows that the only reason he had to use magic powers was because he was too fat to run. So there we have it. You can work miracles, but your best friends will still never be impressed. These are some memory palaces from the time which are said to be able to bring supernatural or um, unexplainable effects. The one on the left is one from the art, the square art. This is one where you balance the elements of earth, air, fire, and water in yourself. This would be protective. This is like making a magical shield around you. The one on the right is called the curved art. This is when you are going to be tuning into higher powers to enhance your function of your mind. These are memory wheels. This is a form of contemplation where each one of these letters represents a different principle. And in your mind's eye, you sit there and you will move the wheel around and you'll line them up differently. You're going to a very deep state of contemplation onto something and achieve a kind of yogic oneness for this. Is this amazing to think of the gentleman, uh, you know, in um, the uh, in 15, 99, the gentlemen, uh, so scholars, all practicing these arts. This is John Dee, uh, the official magician, the Royal Court Astrologer for Queen Elizabeth. This is his memory palace, the hieroglyphic monad. Uh, this is where you memorize each one and you meditate on each one of these points, uh, these planets, and then you combine them in yourself to reach a state of enlightenment. But how did it work? It's quite interesting, this. There are different theories. Some of them are very Neoplatonic. It is about kind of a yoga meditation on something. But in 
Dixon's writings, you start to get a more clear view. And it's quite an exciting one. I want you to imagine that everyone here got together for a weekend. Yes, maybe, maybe we have to wait a bit for the, uh, the social distancing to go. But then we all go to Gordon's house and spend a long weekend there. I'm sure he's up for this. If we spent the whole weekend creating a memory palace of truth. So in our mind's eye, we imagined a building, we could visit one nearby, and at each point of the door, we put one, uh, one of the syllogisms of logic, one of the methods of logic that work. If we made a memory palace of truth, and we practiced it and practiced it and practiced it, the hermeticists believe that your mind can only access information you've remembered powerfully if it's put in the right order. And they believe that if we memorized all the principles of truth, all the logical syllogisms, and all the common uh, misnomers, all the, um, the, the common uh, mistakes, the non sequiturs, and put them in memory palaces, when we left Gordon's house after that weekend, we would have upgraded the operating system of our mind. We'd be like Sherlock Holmes, because truth has been hardwired in a way our mind can just access. It's like our subconscious just knows. If we did another weekend and we did all the muses, the nine muses, and we did all the principles of art, we'd leave amazingly talented at art and music. You could upgrade your mind by remembering things in the right order. So these different memory palaces were normally based on mystical symbols. There would be a sign to the zodiac, there would be um, emblem books, but not like the Christian ones. It would all be going back to Egyptian or Greek. And there'd be many people traveling up to Scotland to try to learn from Dixon and from his students. That direct lineage was there. And this is an important thing to note. Um, and it returned a bit to the classical art here. It's also worth noting that most hermeticists were Christian. It's quite interesting. So they saw this as the mystical teachings that Jesus couldn't say. They saw this as the holy mysteries mentioned in the Bible. And this was how these, these powers, they saw these miracles being worked uh, by uh, the um, apostles. This was how they were going to do the same. And you can see why this is a very Rosicrucian kind of thing. How this would become so the writings on this, we have Giordano Bruno, we have Flood, we have John Dee, and we have Alexander Dixon himself. So there we have it, the three arts of memory. Well, let's have a look at which ones does, do have an influence on Freemasonry. We certainly do use Freemasonry for making speeches. Um, and we get better at making speeches, don't we? And uh, we do stop at different locations to say things in our lodge. But I don't think we'd really feel comfortable seeing Freemasonry as a speech making art. So if there's a classical influence, it's, it's slight. It's worth noting that there was a classical master of memory called James Fowler who was teaching um, James the Sixth the classical art of memory in return for poetry lessons. Imagine that, teaching a king in return for him teaching you poetry. There was, uh, then we had the second art of memory, to change ourselves to be better people. Well, that to me seems to match a lot of Freemasonry. I mean, um, it's just too coincidental to think that in the monasteries around Scotland, they were imagining themselves in King Solomon's temple and drawing it out on the floor. And then the stonemasons start to do the kind of same. They probably learnt it from the people who are employing them. And we still are very focused on being good masons and good people through masonry. And then there's the mystical hermetic art in memory. I think there may be hints of this in Freemasonry. Ideas that you can remember your liberal arts in the right order, or you can remember certain things in certain ways. And I think that probably 
at the time when Freemasons became speculative, there were Rosicrucian orders uh, which were practicing this, that you could join if you were a Freemason. The societies, Rosicrucia in Anglia, uh, the, uh, the most certainly was traced back to a Scottish organization. And we do see um, uh, in some of the poem, the Muses Thoroughly, uh, the, it, it um, mentions uh, the, the quote, that uh, the Freemasons have the power of second sight and they're the brothers of the Rose Cross. So we see a connection between the Masons' word and the Rosicrucians. So I think there may be a gentle influence on, uh, the, uh, uh, on the craft. All in all, I think we can conclude that Shaw was right to call Masonic ritual the art of memory. Here is a diagram from a early um, American expose. I can neither confirm or deny if this is the correct thing that happens in a lodge, and neither can anyone here. Uh, but um, we can see that if it was, they, you certainly do walk around at set points just like in a memory palace. And there certainly are moral lessons there that you keep in your mind. We certainly use corporeal solimitudes. Um, the first reference to a Masonic Lodge is I call it a mosaic palace. And uh, it's actually the wardens and the master that represent wisdom, strength, and beauty, not the, the actual pillars. Emblem books, the types the, the Christians used to have, those lovely books, if you look at them, you'll see they look just like tracing boards. And go into churches and um, other religious places, you'll see a lot of the symbolism we have is just the same there for them. It's just we just kept on doing it. All in all, I think we can say that the Christian art of memory was of most influence on Freemasonry. We can see it matches in so many ways, so much so that some early exposés of Masonry even compare the learning in the lodge to learning in Sunday school because of the catechisms. We use a biblical building, we use biblical lessons. We may be de-Christianized, but we've got the Christian idea that you can memorize to become better. We have a focus on virtue, and though many Freemasons would like to seek enlightenment and develop uh, more of their consciousness more, I think they'd only want to do that if they could do so in a balanced, good way, um, and perhaps have keep their focus on being kind, generous and charitable, rather than uh, seeking anything higher than that. But all in all, I believe all three arts had a powerful influence in the mixing pot that was Renaissance Scotland, where we had exciting people experimenting, studying and thinking. And when the lodges started to open their doors to people of other trades and to gentlemen, I can imagine it was very exciting what they found there. Some people say that the Hermetic art changed the stonemason's ritual. I can't see that happening. I can't imagine that anything would really be changing a, such a strong tradition, a tradition that made them rewrite their book of constitutions, a tradition we knew was willing to stand up against others to keep their tradition. If you disagree with me, perhaps you could suggest to your lodge that you change ritual. Uh, maybe uh, you could move to emulation and see how that goes down. I suspect that, that it wouldn't be uh, unanimously agreed, and I suspect that any changes uh, in those days weren't as well. But that idea and the study of those uh, items certainly became an influence within Scottish masonry. So, Brethren, this concludes my talk, and I must end it uh, before I take questions, just to let those who are of interest in this know where they can go for further information. I've written two books on this subject. The first one, uh, The Mosaic Palace, is a book which is just a guide to 
all these memory arcs we talked about, it's everything I've said, but in more depth, and really comparing it to Freemasonry. And the second one, uh, just released um, two weeks ago, Alexander Dixon wrote a manual or two, and they've never been published in English. We've just been dreaming. What, what was he teaching? How did this mystical art work? I had it translated. It cost a lot of money <laughs> to find someone who translated Renaissance Latin from that area. <laughs> but the expert I found was perfect and knew all the classical sources. So we have got this Scottish memory magician's manual as to how to do it, how you can achieve enlightenment through memory. Uh, maybe you can have a look and see if you think it did influence early Scottish religion. And now uh, I'd be most honoured for any questions. Martin, thank you very much for taking on us on that journey in the art of memory. Uh, I certainly have learnt uh, quite a lot this evening. And uh, I do believe that we will have lots of interesting questions. The first one I have for you from one of our uh, visitors is, uh, would you agree that Giordano Bruno practiced all three arts of memory? The classical, he could remember 30 long speeches, the Christian, he was a monk, and the hermetic, when he spread it around Europe. Oh, yes, so of course he um, was a Dominican monk originally. So yes, wow, what a, what a wonderful question. I'm so glad I came here. Yes, Giordano um, was a fiery character. And I often wonder why, why when he could have taken any student in the whole of the royal court, in Elizabeth's royal court, when all these people were around him and offering him, putting him up and sponsoring him, why he took uh, uh, Dixon as his student, that's very interesting. But yes, um, Bruno was on a, in a different world. He had memory systems within memory systems. He was, very, very disillusioned with Christianity and angry. He was actually angry with it. He thought that it was time for to let go of some of these old images, and he was very disappointed. He looked at the, Christ, at the Catholic Church and thought, you say you know the answers, but you can't sort yourself out. And you've had hundreds of years to do that. Uh, I, don't, I think it's time to rip this all down. I think it's time to go back to a better religion. Bruno thought he was restoring an ancient Egyptian religion, uh, which worshipped the sun. And he thought that everyone, when they found out that we went round the sun, would listen and wake up to that. He was most certainly Christianly um, trained, but poor, near the end of it. Um, he writes a, a book, um, the... Um, the portion of the triumphant beast and uh, if you look in there he's having God uh, in the you put, you put it in the name of Zeus say I'm sorry I've been so immoral I'm sorry of all this jealousy and hurting people and I haven't been a good example I'm going to change it has to start with me I'm sorry I was blaming you <laughs> it is it's quite shocking stuff and um, Yes, I, I'm not surprised uh, he ended up burnt at the stake. So yes, I agree, practiced all three, but near the end, I think he was, was certainly letting go of the original. But when you're brought up Christian, you know, it's always in there somewhere, isn't it? You can see, if you meet someone who's brought up Buddhist or brought up Muslim, even if they, move, they think they move away from it, it's all it's in there. Uh, so I, I sometimes read things and think, wow, it's still in there for you. Thank you. That was a question from one of our previous speakers, Jeffrey. The next wow. question we've got for you, Martin, uh, it comes from one of the, the very talented brothers here who himself is a performer. So it's a, a very interesting question. Did you discover any history of how nerves, stage fright, impairs memory? Yes, indeed. So it's very interesting to read these ancient instructions for modern uh, sort of uh, for modern kind of problems which we would perhaps see a bit differently. So memory, and I suspect this is how they saw Freemason originally, is a path of self-development. 
So the, uh, the idea is you're always uh, going to dedicate yourself to remembering something or learning something as a way of doing things. So um, the, if you meet someone, when you meet them, you're going to really try to remember their name. And you're going to do that by making sure you've got a memory image and you've got many hooks. So you're saying, hello, Gordon, lovely to meet you. Uh, what do you do for a living? And you get that as a hook. And you say, where do you live? And you get that as a hook. And you do that through all circumstances. So you're never backing down from a challenge. If you walk somewhere, you're memorizing the route on the way there. And that way you're always practicing. So when you learn your Masonic ritual, you're always practicing, you're practicing your memory. And they saw that, that nerves could go one way or the other. If you were up for the challenge, uh, and it actually says it in this manual, it's quite amazing. If you're up for the challenge, then you'll see it as excitement, then it will help your memory. If you're lacking confidence and you're worried about the situation, then the nerves will blank your mind. Why it did that, not in this manual, but in some of them is quite funny. Some of the ideas to come up with, they think that your, the heat of your stress can actually dry out the brain temporarily. It might feel like that, but uh, that's the theories they had. Okay, thank you. I think many of us have suffered from stage fright or, or a, a form of stage fright when we've been in front of our brain. I, the, the next is a, a point, and I'm hoping this will be a yes, Martin. I, can we get a copy of the presentation for our Facebook pages that we can share with the Brian? Certainly. Oh, yes. yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Aditya has got a, an interesting question for you. A lot of the hermetic ideas discussed seem to parallel a lot of ideas in the East, particularly in yogic and Hindu schools of thought. Was there any relationship between these two geographies? or are the similarities purely coincidental? Yes, yeah, so the, the, there are some possible connections. Um, the, we know that gymnam sophists, that's what they used to call them, were at, in Alexandria. So we know that Brahman, Yogi, probably Buddhists were there in Alexandria, so they may have had a crossover. But also, um, I think some of it is about what works. So, there are certain, if you really focus on something, it can release a more hidden potential. We've got to remember that the word meditation, meditatio, is a Western word. The concept of enlightenment is a Western, this is a Western word. And enlightenment was when light would come into you from somewhere else. So um, we tend to connect things uh, with uh, yoga and Buddhism and foreign traditions. They've done a lot better to make their teachings more understandable for modern age um, than us. So I think that, yeah, there might be some connection, but I think that also a lot of it is here already, um, just because, you know, you, you travel to Africa and you look at their native boxing, and it's very similar to ours, because we've got the same body, the same way of doing things. Uh, you know, mindfulness or this, this big movement about mindfulness. Prudence, that definition of prudence um, was um, that we would be in the moment so as to make the best judgments. And they used to practice this. Prudence was a kind, was it's just like the mindfulness exercise, make sure that you're, you've got all your senses on. So I think a lot of it is already here um, without communication. Um, as well as some possibility of communication. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, we, we do have an advert, uh, an advert for Lodge Montefiore, 753 through in Glasgow. And Ori states that their second degree is based on the art of memory. And when we get back to normal, whenever that is, uh, contact the secretary if you want to see this concept of, of their own ritual. And oh, I've heard this. This would be wonderful. It's yeah. wonderful. I, yes, I think um, this is an important thing that we need to celebrate. Uh, it's, it's the interesting. Um, uh, the, this art of memory reference in Shaw has been really looked at. But the whole practice of memorization, this whole practice of Masonic memorization, this, this is part of the tradition 
since the, the earliest records. And of course, there's some really early records like the Atchison Havens minutes. You know, I think that's over 400 years of minute books. And yeah, um, it's, it, that's uh, quite amazing. And so, um, yeah, I think it's important that we, we keep this going, um, especially in a time when people are starting to read rituals a lot more. Yeah, okay, thank you. I mean, um, sorry, one thing to add here, which is really important to get across to everyone here, modern science has studied this locational memory. And they've discovered something amazing. And I can show you the studies. They're really, there's three of them. They're really good scientific protocol, very good list. If you practice memory like we do in lots, so it's exactly the same thing. You remember a speech or a positioning, it's locational memory. It changes the way your mind accesses information. It improves it. To the degree where the initial study was surprised, they put people through six weeks of this training, and afterwards they noticed their brains were functioning more like memory champions. They found that you could test people 10 years later, and they were better at remembering normal things, they were more aware, they noticed things better, and they found that all elderly people were more better on their feet. It protected you against um, memory loss to some degree. So when that old past master says to you, he thinks Masonic ritual is kept him young and fresh, he was telling the truth. He was telling the truth. Freemasonry does make your brain more healthy and better. It's provable. And this is something we need to get across. Yeah. Well, Martin, oh, hold on. Sorry, someone, um, yeah, someone has mentioned to me there, then right near Top of the North Lodge. I, I, I would certainly agree with that. My, my father turned 84 at the weekend and he's our oldest past master and our oldest lodge member and he's still active on the floor and he puts us all to shame. And we have a brother who's immediate past is watching us just now. I can see him on the screen and they've got a, a chap, Jim Farmer, who is just a touch off 100 and he's still practicing ritual on the floor regularly and at most meetings. I've got another question for you, Martin, uh, from Sivas. Brother, on remembering the right things, symbols, words could elevate our consciousness, would it help if we meditate upon positive spiritual symbols or even the simple act of surrounding ourselves with positive images? For example, Botticelli painted Primavera for bene benevolent influence on the young man. Yes. So, um... The hermeticists believed that all things were one. And so they actually believed there was um, no, there's nothing that isn't real. So if you have a negative symbol in your house or next to you, that does have an effect. There's, there's no truth, you can't, it, there's no, there's no, it's just in the mind. The mind is as real as other things. And some of the, these books were absolutely beautiful ways to track, to help you. So if you're an elderly woman in Aberdeen uh, in uh, 1624 and you had anxiety problems, your um, spiritual teacher, whether it be a, a, a nun at the convent or a, you know, a priest, they'd be able to get a little book and say, oh, hello, look at this. And they'd show you page five. And it was a beautiful picture. Or it may even be a board, a painting they have, and it would have all these calming symbols. It would be maybe uh, uh, the uh, moments, um, biblical moments, which were seen as complete, everything was all right. And you'd be taught to remember each one of these symbols, and you'd have to remember the story and the meaning and a bit of poetry, and it was just like a tracing board. And it was so involved that when you went home, you practiced every day, your mind was so full of calming symbols, so full of calming sections from the Bible, you know, uh, the moment, the annunciation, the, uh, the lion laying down with the lamb, um, this kind of thing, that you would be meditating on calmness. It's quite clever. And this meditatio pneumonica, this is something that they would teach to help you. If you were perhaps less adept, they might just teach you something to repeat or a poem. So yes, these positive symbols are very, very good. The hermeticists believed 
um, you could go one step further. You could meditate on a, a star or a constellation and you could become at one with those energies. It's like you could catch something from it. You could sit and look at uh, the right constellation and it would be like the rays would come into you and you would be enlightened by it. Uh, so they would go one step further. Some of them, some of them would go one step further. Martin, thank you so much for that this evening. There are so many very positive comments in the chat for you and I'm sure that many of our guests this evening will be making their way to Lewis Masonic uh, website to, to have a look at the, the very many interesting uh, books that you've got there but in particular these two books that take this out of memory back to Scotland and, and again Brian I think uh, as Scots Freemasons we, we can claim uh, to be at the heart of this worldwide craft that we so uh, beloved and are involved in. Uh, and I'm sure Bob Cooper will be sitting through in Edinburgh very happy just now that you're backing up a lot of the things that he says. So Martin, on behalf of the Brern and the Past Masters of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, can I thank you for coming along this evening and giving us a, a very interesting insight into the art of memory. We, we have a, a, a tradition now, we're, we're into our 10th uh, Zoom meeting and I, I now unmute everyone so they can say their good nights and thank yous to you in, in person and then I give a five second countdown and then I close the meeting for everyone. So on behalf of everyone, well, Martin, thank you once again and Brian, I will try to unmute you all. There you go. Uh, thanks, Martin. It was a very interesting talk. Well done. Well done. Well done. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much, Martin. Very neat. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. My mother's name is Forbes, right? That's even better. We'll talk about that offline then, Martin, because that's my family, Tartan and Clan. And oh, my word, yes, my mother. <laughs> and then Hugh Young, my word, there's a, there's a name that I know. Yeah, Hugh, Hugh Thank was you. our speaker last week. Thank you. Ah. So, well, Brian, I, I will leave on the, the one other comment that I didn't mention because it was from my immediate past master uh, and his comment to the group was uh, that he'd forgotten the question he wanted to ask but that is typical John Hearn you see so Brian I'll give you five four bye bye Martin. three two one thanks again Martin good evening and thank you Brian thank you very much